Okay, yeah. so this looks pretty easy, really. We just find two places a few thousand kilometers apart on the Earth and measure the angle to something in space, and then we've got our distance, right? Well, a little bit more nuance than that, Paul, right? You know, we remember measuring angles back in school. Now, okay, well, measuring an angle at 80 degrees, not too bad. What about measuring an angle at 30 degrees? You could probably do it. What about five degrees? What about one degree? You're getting pretty tiny here if you're measuring a one degree angle. And the actual angles in space are much smaller than that. The nearest thing in space is the moon. Yep. And the parallax angle of the moon, if you go a thousand kilometers apart and look at it, you're talking about a, a, a tenth of a degree. And that's about the thickness of that line there. So do you think you could have measured that in primary school? I don't even think I could measure that today with a protractor. So how do we actually do that? How do you can actually do that if you can't really physically take these angles out? Well, I mean, how would I measure very precise angles? You probably want a big piece of kit, yeah. maybe a telescope built on a very securely designed mount so you can very accurately measure the angles. I mean, it's not easy to measure if you've got a very long piece of equipment than the other because then you can move it very small amounts at each end. Yeah. You've got to measure it twice from different places. Yep. So what I might do is have, say, I don't know, um, a big, very rigid metal beam and have a telescope mounted at both ends with a really big protractor on both so I can then measure the angle very accurately from both of those two things. But how big would you actually need to measure that? That's the trick, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the trouble. I mean, this is actually what people really did for range finding on Earth. So this is a military range finder from yeah. World War II. And basically what it has is a telescope at both ends. And they both have a prism, which bounces the light down the middle. And you line up. So you've got a split uh, prism. So you've got the top and the bottom. And you line them both up. And then once they're aligned, then you can measure the angle off and tell you how far away to set your artillery to fire at your enemies. OK. And this is what was used, say, the, in World War I battleships who were typically firing at their enemies from distances of you know, 20 kilometers or so. And they could get the distance accurate enough to maybe hit the target on the third or fourth attempt. Yep. But that's 20 kilometers. That's not distances in space. That's, that's not hundreds of thousands to millions of And kilometers. even for that, these things were like 10 meters long on the bridge of their battleship. Yeah. So you can't really build something a thousand kilometers wide, right? I mean, even today, a thousand kilometer long rod is going to cost a lot of money. And, and even then, the curvature of the Earth is going to get in the way. I mean, <laughs> if, it, if, it's, if it's dead straight and sticks up, it's going to be you know, 50 kilometers high at both ends. I mean, we're talking the entire budget of the world for a decade to build one of these things, right? Which we're obviously not going to get. Even today, let alone in ancient times. <laughs> well, uh, there's probably some other issues as well, right? I mean, it's one thing to measure it over the length, but then if you're measuring at two different points, how do you get the timing down, right? I mean, you don't have a GPS satellite, you have a clock. Yeah, I mean, all these things are moving across the sky. So if, if you're a thousand kilometers away and you measure it a minute before me, it will have moved. So the angle distance would just be because the Earth is rotating and not because it's actual distance. How do you synchronize to accuracies of fractions of a second when you're on opposite sides of the world and don't have GPS or precise clocks? So, so, we, so we need something really big somehow. We need something really accurate in terms of timing. So how did they actually do this? hundreds of years ago, let alone today. Yeah, it was, it was really hard, um, but these are pretty smart people. And the first person we, in historical we know to actually measure distance to the moon, again, the nearest thing, uh, were a bunch of uh, Greeks like Hipparchos in, uh, working in ancient Alexandria about the second century BC. Yep. And they used an eclipse to solve these problems, which is very clever. The basic idea yeah. is they would wait for a solar eclipse when the moon goes in front of the sun, and that solves the timing problem. Because, because it happens at the same time. When you wait for the eclipse to happen, it's going to be at the same time everywhere. Um, and what they found was that uh, back where Hipparchos grew up, which was um, in modern-day Turkey, mm -hmm. there was a total eclipse. Yep. Whereas where he was currently working, down in Alexandria, which is about 1,000 kilometers away, um, it was only a partial eclipse. The moon only blocked about four-fifths of the sun. And this isn't because, obviously, the... Moon was doing th anything different. It was all about how they were viewing it from the position on the Earth. Yes, yeah, so the different position from here was looking at a different angle. So from they look at the same time, it only blocked some and not all of the sun. And so in theory, if you were further up, you would kind of get the reverse image of this. Yes, yeah, so if there had been any astronomer observing it from somewhere in Russia, yep. they would have seen something the other way around. And so that's your distance you have. And they have the timing with the eclipse. So therefore, they kind of solved the two big problems. Yes, so it was very clever. And they got the distance so, um, actually right to within a few percent precision from this. They had to know how far away it was from Alexandria to um, Turkey, but they were actually 
pretty good ge geographers back in those days. Yep. I don't know how they measured it, you know, how long it takes a ship to sail or how long it takes a camel to ride or but something like that. But those would have been that. other practical problems that they've already had to solve, that's right. And they didn't know that very accurately. That was the biggest source of uncertainty. But nonetheless, they were able to find out that the moon was very far away. Mm. It's actually about 450,000 kilometers. Okay. So this is something that almost every textbook gets wrong. They show the Earth and the Moon nearby to scale. But this is an actual real picture of it, taken by the Osiris-Rex spacecraft as it was flying past on the way to somewhere else. Yep. And so, so this is the photo of the Earth and the Moon. Maybe we'll stand back a bit so the camera can see the Moon. There we go. Um, but that doesn't look like the Moon at all. It looks like a dot from here. Yeah. And that's because of how far away it is. You don't really get to see it like you're up close. Yeah. It turns that actually this is, distance to the moon is something you can measure today with a smartphone camera. Um, what you could do is, as the Earth rotates, you're going to be, when you're at the bottom or top, which is when the moon appears to be on the horizon, um, the moon's actually going to be a bit further away than in the middle of the night when the moon's overhead, because you've gone from there round to here. And that's a little one radius of the Earth closer to it. OK. So apparently what you can do, I've not tried this myself, is with modern smartphones you can take a photo of the moon when it's low on the horizon yep. and when it's high in the sky and it'll appear about 2% bigger when it's high in the sky because you're about 2% closer. So as long as you kind of take it at the same distance with your arm or the same position and you take those two images you side by side. You the same zoom on your camera, yes. Yep. And then in principle, it is actually quite measurable. People think the moon looks bigger when it's on the horizon, that's but right. that's a well-known optical illusion. That's yep. actually not true. It's actually bigger when it's overhead. And you can measure that with a smartphone camera, measure how many pixels it is across on the moon. Yep. And assuming you've got a decent enough camera with a big enough zoom, that 2% difference is measurable. And you can use that to work out how far away the moon is for yourself, in case you don't believe anything we're saying. <laughs> So, I mean, I guess this is kind of the great thing. It's the same principle we're talking about, but instead of going really big scale, you're going just a little bit smaller, more precise scale. And it does rely on digital cameras with precise pixels, which ancient Greeks didn't have. That's right.